as online health creators, I think it's very important to be transparent about your own health and to actually show the results that you're doing with your other recommendations and routines. So I've got four reports here. I'm going to look at my results right now that I did most recently, and I'll share with the previous results that I did in February and November with the DEXA scan. I'm going to go through the most significant biomarkers and I'll share what are the optimal ranges for them. So make sure you click like and subscribe for future videos about living longer and staying healthier. So let's start with the glucose markers. In February 2024, my hemoglobin A1C levels were 5%. And in July 2024, my hemoglobin A1C levels were also 5%. So it hasn't changed. Hemoglobin A1C levels measure the average blood sugar levels over the past few weeks. And ideally, you want to have it below 5.2%. My fasting blood sugar levels for both tests were 90 milligrams per deciliter. So there wasn't any change in that either. My fasting insulin levels were also very similar, 3.08 microunits per milliliter in February and 2.98 microunits per milliliter in July. So it's virtually the same. And my C-peptide levels in February were 1.22 and 1.08 in July. So a small decrease, which is a good thing. But all of them are still in the optimal ranges. Next up, we have lipids and cholesterol. In February, my total cholesterol was 172 milligrams per deciliter, which is already quite reasonable. But my total cholesterol in July was 152 milligrams per deciliter, which is a better result. My LDL decreased from 98 to 76 milligrams per deciliter, which is a good decrease. And my HDL also decreased from 62 to 58 milligrams per deciliter. Most importantly, my non-HDL cholesterol decreased from 109 to 93.9 which is a good increase. And my triglycerides stayed relatively the same, 53 in February and 56 in July. So for maximum cardiovascular disease reduction, it's recommended to keep your LDL cholesterol below 70 and even closer to 40 if you're in a high risk category, but I don't have any other risk factors. So 76 is pretty good for me. What about some other cardiac risk factors? In February, my lipoprotein little a was 3.7 milligrams per deciliter. And in July, it's 2.4 milligrams per deciliter. Lipoprotein little a is the biggest genetically determined cardiovascular disease risk factor and it's linearly associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease so the higher the lp little a levels are the higher the risk appears to be so anything above five milligrams per deciliter starts to already slowly increase the risk but unfortunately it is very much genetically determined so this is one of the tests that you can't really modify that much but as you can see from this blood test result i did decrease my lipoprotein little a levels a little bit so of course i was in the beginning already in the low risk category 3.7 is very low risk but i decreased it to 2.4 milligrams per deciliter which is even a lower risk so you can control it a little bit but not a lot that's why if you have high LP little a levels because of genetics, so for example, your LP little a levels are 70, 80, 100, 120, something like that, then uh, you would need to be more careful with the other risk factors, such as ApoB, cholesterol, homocysteine, and inflammation, which we'll cover as well. My ApoB levels, which is a big risk factor for heart disease, were 77 milligrams per deciliter in February and 61 in July, which is a good decrease. ApoB levels below 70 are associated with the lowest risk of heart disease. And my ApoB and ApoA ratio also decreased. So a lower ApoB and ApoA ratio is better for cardiovascular disease risk reduction. I'm not taking any pharmaceuticals, or lipid lowering drugs all of this is the result of just modifying my diet and the biggest change i did with my diet was the reduction of uh, dietary saturated fat and as you can see you can achieve very good lipid levels with apoB and uh, cholesterol and other things without using statins. My homocysteine levels, which is another risk factor for heart disease, were 12.1 micromoles per liter in February, which isn't that optimal. Ideally, it should be below 10. So 5 to 10 is the lowest risk category. But fortunately, I did decrease my homocysteine to 9.7 micromoles per liter in July. The biggest change I did during this time period was support my methylation. So I started to take 2 grams of TMG. And uh, TMG is a methyl donor that helps with uh, reducing homocysteine levels. There are other methyl donors that can achieve it as well, like B12, some other B vitamins, creatine, glycine, even MSM and some other sulfur donors. And there are some other things that actually raise your homocysteine levels as well, such as exercise. So a lot of exercise tends to raise homocysteine levels. And I'm a kind of a person who does exercise quite a lot and quite frequently. So uh, my homocysteine levels might have been elevated because of that, but I didn't change my exercise during that time period. So I'm exercising pretty much as much and even more, perhaps. So I think the two grams of TMG might have done the trick in this uh, scenario. And homocysteine is also something that is very genetically determined. Some people can have naturally very 
very low homocysteine levels, even though they're not taking any methyl donors, and even though they're you know following somewhat of a worse diet, for example. And other people can take all the methyl donors in the world. They can have actually very low levels of exercise and still have homocysteine levels in the 15s or something. So for example, Joe Cohen, who was also at the retreat with me, his um, homocysteine levels are quite elevated because of genetics. So he's taking a lot of different kinds of methyl donors to support his homocysteine levels, and he tries to get it lower, but it's not really working because he might have some bad genetics for homocysteine. And he doesn't exercise that much. I exercise twice as much as Joe. I take half of the methyl donors that he's taking, and my homocysteine is even slightly better than his because of genetics. And I don't think that I have perfect homocysteine genetics because it's still like 9.7 micromoles per liter. It could be, you know, slightly lower even. Like I would want it to be closer to five. So my goal is to try to get it to five, but 9.7 is already in a pretty good uh, category right now. It's just because of there's a lot of genetic factors that uh, contribute to this. Moving on with kidneys, my kidney function was optimal in both February and July. So there was no real differences between my electrolytes or my other kidney markers like blood urea nitrogen, serum creatinine, or cystatin C. My EGFR was 108 in February, which is still very optimal. Like anything above 100 is already in the optimal zone. But my EGFR did increase to 120 in July, which is even better. The biggest difference that I attribute this to might be my reduction in phosphorus intake. So phosphorus is a mineral that in excess tends to affect kidney function in a negative way, especially in the presence of low magnesium status. So I did reduce my phosphorus intake slightly, and that comes from the reduction in animal protein mostly, and I'm increasing my magnesium intake from foods. So more magnesium-rich foods like pumpkin seeds, beans, uh, some sort of leafy greens, and uh, salmon, for example. My liver function is also optimal in both February and July, so there's no real difference in my liver enzymes but my liver enzymes like GGT, AST, and ALT are slightly lower in July than they were in February. So it's a minor improvement, although before it was already quite optimal. Moving on with my thyroid. So my thyroid levels are also same in February and July. My T3 levels are somewhat low, 67 nanograms per deciliter in February and 69 nanograms per deciliter in July. And this is probably mostly because of eating a lower calorie diet and being lower body weight. So I have lost quite a significant amount of weight over the last year and most of it is because of fat, as I'll share with you in my TEXA scan results. And uh, when you are dieting or losing weight, then your T3 levels might reduce slightly. Now, I don't have any symptoms of low thyroid. I have very high energy levels. I have excellent sex drive. I have good physical performance. I have no uh, cold intolerance. My skin is great and my bones are great as well. So I think this is mostly because of uh, this artifact of the calorie restriction, which in my opinion is actually a good thing. So there is a lot of evidence that a slightly lower thyroid level and uh, function and higher TSH levels is actually linked to greater longevity in centenarians and centenarian offsprings. So the centenarians, they have slightly lower thyroid naturally because of genetics and a higher TSH level. So uh, I don't think that I'm experiencing any harmful side effects from this slightly lower T3 level. And in my personal opinion, it actually might be more optimal because of a uh, like a normal or a lower, let's say, body weight is still linked to longevity. And I have excellent muscle mass, as I'll share with my DEXA scans, and I don't have any bone density issues either. My bone density is very high. So I think this would be a good time to talk about my DEXA results. We'll resume with the blood test results after this. So a DEXA scan is a very good way to assess your body composition, to look at your body fat percentage, muscle mass, visceral fat, and bone density. Now, the total body fat percentage on this machine might be a bit off calibrated, so it overestimates your total body fat percentage but uh, that's because of it looks at your total body fat percentage, not just the subcutaneous fat. So it just uses a, like a different scale that uh, might be somewhat different from what you've seen online. I did the DEXA scan in November. My previous result was 23.3% body fat, but I was very lean and with veins in my abs. So if you were to look at my subcutaneous fat percentage, then it would be something like 10%, even 9%. This time, my body fat based on the machine was 18.2%, and I was a little bit leaner. I was also about 2 kilograms lighter from the previous test in November, and it all came from uh, fat loss. So the subcutaneous fat percentage might be something like 8%. So take it with a grain of salt. These percentages, the machine might be using a different scale as you might be used to. And if you were to base on the mirror test, then yes, my body fat percentage would be something like 8 to 10%. 
I also lost visceral fat, which is the fat around the organs. And this is, from a metabolic health perspective, uh, quite important. Now, keep in mind that you can't have literally zero visceral fat. Some visceral fat is needed for survival, and it has uh, some other purposes. It's just that excess amounts of visceral fat is harmful for your metabolic health and uh, other aspects of health. The healthy amount of visceral fat that you can get away with would be something below 450 grams or one pound of visceral fat. My first result in November was 359 grams, and now now it's 54 grams. So I've lost 300 grams of visceral fat within these eight months, which is amazing. And again, 50 grams of visceral fat is as ideal as you can really get within reason. My lean muscle mass, however, increased. My total body percentage as lean mass was 72.3% in November and 77.3% now. That's a 5% increase again. So I lost 5% body fat and I gained 5% as lean tissue. Now keep in mind that this doesn't mean that I built 5% muscle within that time period. It's just, you know, I lost body weight more specifically I lost body fat so I didn't lose muscle tissue so I maintained and actually built a small amount of muscle tissue and therefore my total body weight as lean tissue increased by five percent so I lost body fat which uh, increased my total body percentage as lean tissue if that makes sense my appendicular lean mass index which measures the muscle mass in the arms and legs only was 8.9 kilograms per square meter in November and now it's 9.1 kilograms which is an increase of 0.2 kilograms this puts me in the top percentile of my age group for muscle mass. Now this 0.2 kilograms doesn't sound like a massive amount, but I do think it's quite significant. You saw I lost a lot of body fat, so I lost like 3 kilograms of body fat and 300 grams of visceral fat while actually building 0.2 kilograms of muscle mass. So I didn't lose any muscle in this time period, which is an excellent result. And this is what you want. You want to lose zero muscle and potentially build it a small amount and then lose most of your body weight as uh, body fat. So this is what I did. I lost 3 kilograms of body fat and I built 0.2 kilograms of muscle mass in my arms and legs, which I think is just an amazing result. That was actually actually worry that I might have lost a little bit of muscle mass because of being a lower calorie diet. But, uh, you know, because of exercise and eating enough protein, I was able to build a small amount of muscle tissue while losing exclusively body fat. And I didn't actually increase my protein intake that much. I actually reduced my protein intake by a little bit. So I was eating something like 120 to 140 grams of protein right now for the last few months. And uh, last year when I did the Texas scan, I might have eaten a little bit more. I might have eaten 150 to 160 grams of protein. So I was reducing my protein intake by about 10% while still building muscle tissue in small amounts and losing exclusively body fat, which is amazing. Let's get back to the final blood test markers. My iron levels in February were pretty optimal. My serum iron levels were around 104 and the lowest risk of mortality somewhere between 45 to 115. Right now, my iron levels were 57.4 micrograms per deciliter, which is a bit lower, but it's still in the optimal range. Now, iron levels, in my opinion, would be optimally slightly lower. So for men, below 100 is actually a good level for iron because iron is a risk factor for heart disease as well. Now, an iron level of 100 isn't going to increase your risk of heart disease uh, at all, virtually. But uh, in my personal opinion, having your iron level slightly lower is uh, better for long-term cardiovascular disease risk reduction. Now, my transfer and saturation did decrease from 34% to 17.53% which isn't that good, an ideal transfer and saturation is like 30%. But this is because I have reduced my red meat consumption quite a lot over the last few months, and which is why my iron levels are also uh, quite low. Now, I don't have any symptoms, again, of uh, low levels of iron or iron deficiency. I have high energy. I have a good uh, vascular function. I have good cardiovascular fitness. My VO2 max is high. So I don't have any you know, side effects of having low iron levels. But this was just an experiment to see, okay, how does a reduction in red meat consumption affect my other biomarkers. So across the board, virtually all the other biomarkers improved. So my lipids, my ApoB, my inflammation CRP levels, all those things improved uh, while reducing my red meat consumption. My kidney function improved as well. So the only thing that did decrease was the serum iron levels and the transfer and saturation. This is somewhat of like a balancing act. Okay, how much I would need to have my iron levels and uh, how much would be like optimal. So again, you know, in the next few months, I might change my diet. Again, I might increase my like uh, red meat consumption a little bit, see how 
it affects my iron levels. But again, I don't have any symptoms or I don't feel any different in terms of uh, my physical fitness or my mental performance or anything of that. So we don't necessarily know, like maybe this is actually the optimal iron level. <laughs> so who knows? Let's also talk about the steroid panels or cortisol and uh, testosterone levels. My cortisol and deoxycortisol levels in both tests were elevated, but that's mostly because of traveling and jet lag and some aspects of sleep deprivation. So I did these tests in my retreat in India. So I had to travel almost like 20 hours to get there. And this aspect of sleep deprivation probably affected my results. My testosterone levels also decreased slightly from 691 to 540 and my free testosterone decreased from 17.99 to 16.11. So this might be again because of the weight loss and calorie restriction. I have been reducing my calorie intake, losing you know a few kilograms of weight over this time period. So this might have affected uh, these results. So it makes sense. But again, I have no difference in how I feel or how my physical performance is. My strength is slightly lower because I am I carry less uh, body weight overall, but otherwise I don't have any problems related to how I feel. So I am with high energy, motivation, drive, sex drive. I have good cognition, good physical performance. I have no symptoms of um, you know suffering from a slight reduction in uh, testosterone. So with testosterone, it's almost like, yeah, anything within the normal range kind of does it <laughs> in terms of that there's no evidence that you would uh, perform better or would feel better with a testosterone that is significantly higher. And I would need to do these tests again in my home setting to see what my testosterone levels are at home when I'm not sleep deprived, when I'm not jet lagged, and when I haven't under eaten within the last 24 hours. So because I'm traveling, I'm not going to be eating as much food because of that. And lastly, I also did a VO2 max test. So I increased my VO2 max by three points compared to the previous one. Overall, I'm very pleased with these blood test results. And these are one of the best results I've had in terms of just the cardiovascular disease aspect. These are like very good lipids and my ApoB and CRP levels are as optimal as you can get uh, with without any use of uh, pharmaceuticals. So yeah, I'm very kind of pleased with my results. I'm also pleased with my DEXA scan results to see that oh, I lost three kilograms of pure fat and gained 0.2 kilograms of uh, muscle mass, which I think is, you know, the optimal scenario that you want. And my bone density stayed the same, so that didn't uh, change at all. So what is next? I am going to, of course, maybe adjust my diet slightly. Based on these results, I'm going to try to get my homocysteine even lower. So my goal would be like five. Optimally, let's see if it's possible. We don't know necessarily how much is possible with your genetics, but uh, let's see where, where I can take it. And the next goal would be to see, okay, would eating more calories maintain my current body composition and how will it affect my thyroid? and testosterone levels, for example, let's see in a few months, how does uh, maybe increasing calorie intake affect these? And we also need to look at the other biomarkers. So does increasing my calorie intake worsen my lipids? And is it going to worsen my glucose parameters or kidney function? And where's the trade-off? So like, is it better to have these optimal lipids and optimal cardiovascular disease risk factors and optimal kidney function, etc., but slightly lower thyroid and slightly lower testosterone? Or is there a way to have both? So let's see. I'm going to have to experiment and test. And of course, I'll share with you the results later. If you do want to learn about the optimal broad ranges for all these biomarkers, then you can learn that from my new book, The Longevity Leap. You can check out the link for this in the description. On that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure to click a like and subscribe for future videos about living longer and staying healthier. My name is Seem. Stay optimized, stay empowered.